When the digging ended, the total was 27 murdered. William Reese is the only suspect in the murders of Jessica Kane, Laura Smither, Kellyanne Cox, and Tiffany Johnston. They got me set up like I'm a serial killer right now. Tata is charged with four counts of manslaughter for this February 24th fire that killed four children. Hello everyone, and welcome to season two of The Evidence Room. For those of you who may be new, The Evidence Room is a series where we take you deep into the Harris County criminal court archives, and we examine different pieces of evidence that make up some of the worst crimes our area has ever seen. In this first episode of season two, we're looking at the case of Ronald Lee Haskell. The crime tape the police cars the standoff, a neighborhood bearing witness to tragedy as it unfolded. Ronald Haskell had killed six of the seven members of the Stay family by the time he held himself up. For law enforcement, there was one goal, get Haskell out, get him cuffed. In joining me is my colleague, KPRC 2's Brandon Walker. Thanks for coming in, buddy. Thank I appreciate that. Robert, a pleasure. This is awful. Mm -hmm. six, six members of one family murdered, and I know that you covered this extensively. Tell us about this. So I had the chance to cover the trial, mm -hmm. essentially gavel to gavel. When this happened in 2014, in fact, I was not at KPRC. I arrived a few months later, mm -hmm. but did cover the trial from start to finish, and oh my goodness, what a trial it was. So, Ron Lee Haskell is not even from the Houston area. No. He actually drove here to commit these murders, correct? Yes, and that's a significant detail here in the prosecution's case because what he did was he drove here uh, to, with the intention of killing his ex-wife. Uh, he masterminded uh, a really good uh, plan of attack that ultimately he was able to carry out except for one person in that family who did survive. So Haskell drove here, he drove here and he arrived at his ex-wife's sister's house. And that's in spring, That right? is in spring. He uh, arrives in a FedEx vehicle in a FedEx uniform with a package. It's all a part of his ploy to get inside with every intention of killing the family, that is. So he had a disguise. So it was essentially he wore a disguise. He did. He did. And so the prosecution argues that this is an example of someone who knew exactly what he was doing. But Ronald Haskell's defense argues that he suffered from schizophrenia. This was well documented. He tried to get help in the past. He never did. So someone of his mental inability, so to speak, wouldn't be able to know what he was doing when he did. Even though he took the time to plan out where he would go and bring a disguise with him. And that's the argument that ultimately won out, that if he was able to plan it out the way that he, he did, with the timing working out, including the date um, significant to when his wife, uh, uh, Melanie, filed for divorce, then he must have been of sound mind to carry this out the way that he did. And his ex-wife, did she, she came here because he was, he was abusive, right? right? Right, So she was essentially running from him. She was running away from him, not essentially. She ran away from Ronald Haskell. And during testimony, she testified, in fact, during trial and uh, talked about uh, the years of abuse she suffered. Oftentimes, she would say she could never understand what would trigger him. There would just be these violent attacks and she would try to get away. And that's when he would say, oh, well, you know, no one loves me or I have problems, I need someone to help me, and she would stay. And so it's years of abuse until she ultimately r ran to Texas. Okay. So he comes and he goes to her sister, so essentially mm -hmm. his ex-sister-in-law's mm -hmm. house. Mm -hmm. And it's, what, a mother and father and their four children? Yes, yeah, so this is Stephen and Katie Stay. Mm -hmm. um, this, again, is the sister of Melanie Stay. Mm -hmm. Now, Stephen uh, and, and, and Katie were not home when this occurred. The children were. They're, they're, uh, they're five children, including the eldest daughter, Cassidy, who opened the door. Mm -hmm. She opens the door and she sees Uncle Ronnie, as she calls him, at that door with his FedEx uniform and, and, and the package. And a little confusing, but she lets him in because she knows exactly who he is. Haskell waits, however, for mom and dad to get home. Oh. And that's when everything is carried out execution style. So he just shoots them all? He does. Wh why? Wh 
I understand there's the anger towards the okay. ex-wife. She has okay. run away from him essentially okay. because of the years of abuse. Why go after her sister and her entire family? Sure, that came up in testimony too, but if I can't get to Melanie, then I'm gonna get the next best thing, and that is her family. One of the things, even though I did not cover this the way that you did, especially gavel to gavel, one of the things that I remember just killed me was the 911 call mm -hmm. from Cassidy. <laughs> What is your name? Cassidy Stay. <laughs> <laughs> Are they still there? Who shot them? My uncle Ronnie. Yeah, they're still there. Where is your uncle? My uncle, his name is Ronnie. Where is Ronnie. He? Where is he? He loves to teach his kids. Oh, your uncle shot him? Yeah. Did that come up during trial? It did. In fact, the 911 audio was replayed during trial. And. Uh, she was very calm throughout all of this. Um, she knew that she had to play dead, and Robert, what's significant about this is that Cassidy State was 15 years old at the mm -hmm. time, didn't really understand the, 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 the overall magnitude of what was going on, but she did know that Uncle Ronnie showed up and shot and killed her family. So she plays dead. Her hand, essentially, um, is, 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 is what protected her bullet got her in her finger. She calls 911 and says that uh, uh, my Uncle Ronnie killed my family. He's left. And so then that's when we have the standoff that ensued. Okay, so he thought she was dead too. Mm -hmm. So he just shoots them all. He doesn't care. He just shoots mm -hmm. everyone. He does. Okay, and then he left, but he was going somewhere else. He wasn't right. finished, was right. he? Well, he was looking for his ex-wife and she had been staying uh, with relatives, with her mother mm -hmm. uh, in the area. And that's where he was headed. He was looking for her, um, but authorities- So remember that, because there was an actual chase. Right, and so authorities ultimately found him at the end of a cul-de-sac, and that's where that standoff took place. Wow, what happened during the standoff? And I know you covered gavel to gavel, but I think there was, there was actual audio. Well, I know in the, in the county archives, there's audio recordings of mm -hmm. the discussions between mm -hmm. Haskell and police during the SWAT stand. -up. Right, and that investigator who tried to negotiate with him testified as well in attempting to uh, get Ronald Haskell out of that car. Can you roll down the window for me? Why? I can talk to you right now. Okay. Kind of silly question, ain't it? Let's pretend that I'm not stupid. Okay. Let's well, check. This is a bad scenario, but I can ensure your safety if they'll just come out, okay? You know I'm not coming out. Why not? Because I'm not going to jail. You have those guys make good decisions. I'll make my own Well, I understand that, but I don't want I don't want you to to do any action that forces them into something, okay? Did you tell your spike on the roof he's not got a very good shot on me there? <laughs> Yeah, I'm not judging him. Well, his scope may clear the light bar, but that bullet ain't going to clear it. Okay. Well, you know what? I'm not worried about the sniper and the shot that he's got. You know, he's just, he's just there as a backup. He's not there to do it, to, to pull that trigger unless, unless there's a problem, okay? One of the things that Haskell himself said was, you know, I, I, I tried to get help, no one helped me. Um, Isn't that the case? I mean, I, I see that so much. Sure. It's nobody else. It's not my fault. Mm -hmm. It's somebody else's mm -hmm. fault. And that's another thing that came up in trying to uh, paint a character sketch of Ronald Haskell throughout the trial, and that um, with his challenges growing up, there seemed to be this, um, this, this theme of exclusion, right? So it's, it's not me, it's something else. My goodness. In, in his abuse, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't know if this came up during trial, but his abuse went beyond his ex-wife. Didn't he, didn't he essentially attack his own mother? He did. He did attack like, his Like, tied her up? Right. And this, was, and this was during the estrangement. He was staying with his family. The couple had lived in Logan, Utah, until last year, when Haskell's wife, Melanie, got a protective order against him and filed for divorce. The protective order was filed June 9, 2013, exactly a year to the day of the murders. Haskell was charged with assaulting his own mother in San Diego County, California last week. He allegedly showed up at her home there in San Marcos, demanding she tell him where his ex-wife was. According to court records, he used duct tape to tie his mother to a chair and then assaulted her. 
We'll be right back. When we return, you're going to hear more of Cassidy Stay's statements to her uncle during his capital murder trial. He had been planning and prepping and getting ready for this moment. Intentional, deliberate, planned down to the T. That's what prosecutors argue in their case against Ronald Haskell on day one of his capital murder trial. During the trial, did you get the sense that this took a while to plan? Yes. Well, first of all, the trip alone, someone who, let's, let's, let's be honest, Ronald Haskell did have some struggles and, and he, was, he was dealing with that. He was, he was, he was in California, his family, his wife had divorced him, years of abuse, etc. He was still able to uh, get to Texas from California, drive here, rent a vehicle to do so, and orchestrate this plan to kill folks. In, a, you know, in addition to, to, to planning out the drive, wearing his FedEx uh, uniform, one of the other things too, it looked like in the archive, was that he actually tried to muffle somewhat of the weapon. Do you remember much of the weaponry coming out? Yes, there was a pillow in a FedEx box that was used as a silencer. Using that further goes to premeditation. Exactly, and so that's why throughout this trial, while the defense was making its argument that Ronald Haskell, again, struggled with mental illness, the details here were just way too coordinated to think that someone who didn't have control of their faculties could carry out something like this. So it was lost upon me pretty early, uh, the claim that it was not he who did this, however it was something else. And I was really curious as to what the defense's evidence was going to be to prove that Ronald Haskell's mental capacity uh, prevented him from understanding what he had carried out. And they weren't able to do that. Admittedly, it's really hard to prove someone has, a, uh, has been diagnosed with something that they had not been diagnosed with. And I've said this before, because there's a lot of cases where that, that comes up sure. as, as a defense. And it, it's, it's, nobody's saying that the person isn't mentally ill, but that burden of, did you know right from wrong, that's the burden that, that is incredibly hard to overcome because it's very hard to prove that, okay, yes, you're mentally ill, but you knew right from wrong right. at the time you did because, and I'm guessing was this something from the prosecution that, that okay, if you didn't know what you were doing is wrong, why'd you wear a disguise? Mm -hmm. Why did you try and muffle mm -hmm. the sound uh, of, the, of the weapon? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's their case. I mean, again, it all plays out in a way that's really organized um, and really detailed. And so it's really hard to, 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 pose the, to prove the point that he wasn't able to do this on his own. In a case where intent is the focus, to whom were hostage negotiators talking? Ronald Haskell of sound mind and body or a man battling mental illness, unable to grasp what he had done. On the stand, Sergeant Lonnie Cox of the Harris County Sheriff's Office, one of three hostage negotiators on scene, testifying for the prosecution. Cox testified Haskell seemed lucid, turning to stall tactics to bide his time. At one point during the call, Haskell said, quote, she took the kids away from me. Everybody's telling me I'm crazy. Cross-examination interrogated whether Sergeant Cox gave serious thought to Haskell's mental state. At one point, Haskell said he was manic depressive, and when Cox asked if he was on any medications, Haskell replied, no. You know you can get help for that, Cox said. I tried in California. No one understood, Haskell replied. A textbook example of a man battling mental illness pushed the defense during cross-examination. At several points, the defense probed. Haskell said he couldn't think or heard voices. Their point? How's that the voice of a man who understood truly what he had done? I've always found you to be a really astute study of people in watching your other stories. You're watching Haskell during this trial and all. What did you get from that? I sincerely thought, Robert, that this is a man who tried to control a woman for years, and he did control her and she was able to get away with their children and get to safety, but that wasn't good enough for him because he belonged to her. And while he didn't kill her, he killed her sister, her nieces and nephews, he killed her family and then tried to kill her. And throughout the trial, there was no emotion for simple loss of life. And it was apparent to me that not only was this guy guilty, he did it, he knew what he did. 
There's no way that you could sit there and not show anything if you just didn't care about your actions. What was interesting, and I, I don't know if they played these during the trial, but in the archives, there's recorded phone calls between Haskell and he's talking to somebody uh, in jail. And you know, they record those those phone calls. Did you ever, was any of that brought out during the trial? No, that did not come out. Okay, one of the things that it goes back to the whole, it's, it's, it's everybody else's fault mm -hmm. but mine. It was interesting when you listen to those phone calls, he talked about how scared he was being in jail. It's tough, you know, just just because I know what my mindset was and stuff before and, and don't feel guilty yet, you know, so it's hard yeah. to repent for stuff that you don't feel guilty for because you don't think you know, that it was wrong, which is hard day for people to understand, I guess, but... And that always strikes me. It's like, you commit this unbelievably heinous act, you steal an entire family from a child, but you're scared? Right. Well, if you don't think that you did anything wrong, then you're not going to see the wrong that you did. And I think that that's what we're dealing with with someone like him. He truly believes that it was not he who carried out this. He wasn't in control of his mental capacity, and as such, these people are dead. There is a point to make about the fact that, you know, people go through struggles and challenges, but their answer isn't killing someone, normally. Right, because I think you summed it up perfectly. I mean, he, this was a considerable amount of planning. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he bought the weapons, planned the drive, knew where to go, knew where he was gonna go after that, muffled, tried to muffle mm -hmm. one of the weapons, brought a disguise, I mean, it's just everything. And what he did not expect is that Cassidy State would survive. Who's been shot? My mom, my dad, and my two little sisters and my two little brothers. Okay. And I'm bleeding. How many people have been shot? All seven of them. Seven people have been shot. Yes, okay. ma'am. The lone survivor of the 2014 massacre describing how she was alone that day with her four younger siblings while her parents ran an errand. Her aunt's abusive ex-husband, Ronald Haskell, showed up at her home disguised as a FedEx delivery man. He had a gun and forced his way inside. Cassidy telling the jury, quote, I tried my best not to freak out, but I started to panic because I knew he was dangerous. Cassidy said she did her best to keep her young brothers and sisters calm, pleading with Haskell not to hurt them, telling the jury, quote, I just started to pray. When her parents did return home, Cassidy says her mother, Katie, screamed at Haskell, asking what he was doing there. He said he came to get his children, who he thought were living with the state family. Cassidy getting up to show the jury how her mother tried to fight Haskell to get the gun out of his hand, Katie Stay becoming the first victim. Then, as they all laid on the ground, Cassidy described how Haskell opened fire on the rest of her family. It was boom, 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 all in a row, she told the jury, rapid succession, moving down the line. Cassidy then showing the jury the wound left behind by a bullet that grazed her head. Let's go to the punishment phase uh, uh, of the trial. So what was the essential argument for the death penalty in this case? I know he killed multiple people, which d defines capital punishment, but the DA doesn't always go for the death penalty, even when the death penalty is an option. Did you get a sense of why, in this case, they sought that out? Mm -hmm. it, it seemed to me that their ultimate argument there was, Ronald, uh, the act that was carried out was so egregious, so meticulously planned, so awful, that there was no other answer than capital murder, than, than the death penalty here, considering the circumstances at play. The district attorney's office rarely uh, goes for a, a, a death penalty conviction, but this was something that Kim Og and her team were, were pretty serious about. Yeah, because I mean, one of the questions a juror has to answer, if you're going to give somebody death penalty, do you consider this person a future threat? Right, right. And, and, that's, and, and, and that's what came up, that, you know, Haskell's defense argued that he was not a threat to anyone else, um, that he would get treatment, he would be behind bars, but that's really hard to, to, to prove. The defense argued Haskell was suffering from mental illness and is not a danger to society and jail. So will he be a future danger to his society? I think the answer is going to be clearly no. They also said some of his family members will testify on his behalf. He'll be institutionalized, he'll be contained and he won't be a threat. And I remember thinking in court when, when, when this testimony was going on and they were trying to uh, just get him life, well, if, 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 if it's ultimately true that your, 
your 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 um, your client with schizophrenia uh, carried out this attack, but has no control over what he did. Doesn't recall it was someone else who had done so. Who's to say that something like this can't happen again? Right, right. How is is how can you say that he's not going to feel slighted or wronged in some other way, and and seek retribution? And for the record, that's not a but that's not Brandon Walker's justification for the death penalty at all. It's just that's just how the car. No, it's just a fact of why they why right. they chose that route. Exactly. Did it? Do you do you remember if the jury took much time to deliberate that? They didn't take much time at all. Um, it, it you know it was it was extensive uh, just the, uh, the the statements, but they didn't take much time at all. I, I believe that yeah. they came back fairly quickly. Okay, both you said guilt and innocence and in mm -hmm. punishment, okay. And then Cassidy's impact statement came after that, correct? Mm -hmm. It did. Okay, what was it like watching the jury and other members of the courtroom as that young lady took the stand? So, whenever you cover a trial and you look for, and, and that star witness is testifying, you do zero in on jurors just to get a sense of whether it's working. And you could see the pain on these people's faces, having to experience through Cassidy Stay's words what she had experienced. So there was a juror who wiped her eyes. I remember taking note of that um, uh, uh, while in the courtroom. Uh, but they were zeroed in on her, and I knew at that point that it was going to be tough for Haskell's defense team to to to, to really provide a challenge to that. You think here's a 15-year-old girl. Mm -hmm whose entire family is stolen from her in one fell swoop. And I'll never forget when she told him, I will forget you. Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine being in the courtroom, mm -hmm. listening to that. Do I think the punishment fits the crime? No. I hope that when you die, you will get the punishment you deserve from God. Cassidy Stay speaking directly to Ronald Haskell, the man who killed her parents and four siblings. Cassidy was shot too, but survived. When I heard that you felt no remorse, something changed inside of me. And I didn't know what to do with that change. And it was causing me a lot of hurt and anger because that was my closure. My closure was the hope that you would feel bad. I'm letting go of my emotions and I'm giving it to God because he'll take care of me and he'll help me through this. I'm going to continue to live my life with happiness and I'm gonna move forward and I'm gonna forget about this. And I'm gonna forget about you. So we asked her what she was thinking and of course that's the cliche question, right? As you're saying what you say, but it is important. And she said that she felt that there was responsibility to speak on behalf of the family who can't speak. And that's why she was there, and that's why she was so strong, and that's why she was adamant about making sure that Ronald Haskell, or Uncle Ronnie, as she referred to him in that 911 audio, was sentenced to death. Did he react at all? No. No emotion from Ronald Haskell throughout the trial. And I went back and preparing for this conversation to, to really just kind of see how his, you know, just get a, get a sense of his mannerisms, and no, nothing. Completely absent. Ronald Lee Haskell, uh, the jury having found you guilty of the capital murder of Stephen Stay and Katie Stay and having returned a unanimous affirmative verdict to issue number one and a unanimous negative verdict to issue number two, the court sentence you, sentences you to death by lethal injection. One of the things that always, when I went back and I watched a lot of the, the, the footage, especially the raw mm -hmm. uh, of him, one of the things that always strikes me is you wonder how much of it's an act because he came across just pure physical looks. It's this kind of poor, pathetic, yeah. sad, sure. sad creature. But that's not really the truth of who he is, mm -hmm. is it? No, and that also came up in testimony just about how Ronald Ask was not a dumb person. Mm -hmm. And he and Melanie had known each other for years and they were, the family would just talk about how smart he was and how many different ideas he had and all these other things, but he could never really get his life together. Did the ex-wife testify ever? She did. Um, she she did. She testified. She 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 discussed their marriage and the abuse that she 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 witnessed with him. She was there through the process. I can't imagine. I can't imagine the trauma that that has to that has to cause in a family. I mean, yes, they want to see justice done, but to have to relive it over and over again has got to be a terrible burden. The family was there every day. I think, despite what happened, they considered it important to be there so that Ronald Haskell himself could know that he wasn't gonna get away with what they had done to them personally. Um, 
I was so taken away by how strong they were to be there and to sit there and to listen to that. Um, we hear some pretty egregious details as a reporter, but that was something that was so awful, Robert. It was so awful. And what's awful about it, I truly believe, is the reason why Ronald Haskell is, is, is on death row right now. And that's because it was so meticulously planned out. It was so egregiously detailed. And again, had it not been for that one very strong 15-year-old, he would have carried out everything that he had planned to do. Well, that's, I mean, it seems like that way. If, he, right. if Cassidy had not survived and dialed 911, mm -hmm. he would have probably killed his ex-wife, too. And, and whoever else was with her. Cassidy knew that. And so that's why she played dead there. And she knew where he was going after, because she knew why. Why else would he show up to kill them? Well, didn't he ask when he first got there? Where was she? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel a lot of relief. It feels like a huge weight has been lifted off my chest, and I feel like justice is finally going to be served. And I'm glad that I don't have to worry about it anymore. Going through, as you know, we as reporters hear some egregious details, and there are obviously stories that will never, ever leave us or leave our psyche, so to speak. I always think about that. What stays with you about this story? Because clearly it is still fresh in your mind. What sticks with me the most on this one, Robert, honestly, is Cassidy. Um, she is the reason why we're here talking about this, because she is the reason why uh, Ronald Haskell ultimately didn't carry out what he, he didn't complete the task. And it's a testament in strength and perseverance. And that may sound like cliche descriptors, but how do you muster the, the understanding to know that this guy is going to go continue his killing spree? He's already killed everyone in the room. I got to do something. And she's in the room with her dead family. And that's a takeaway for anyone. I mean, just understand. I mean, how? How? Because a lot of people would have been stunned into inaction. And at the time of the trial, uh, she was a student in college. Um, she was working. I mean, this is someone who went from being, you know, older sister to a party of one. Well, I mean, that's, I, I thought about that. She went from being a sister to basically representing her entire family. Exactly. And, and I will say this. I remember when I had said it earlier at the beginning of this that she had said, I will forget you. And I was like, what an incredibly powerful, brave statement. But I remember at the same time thinking, you know that's not possible. Mm -hmm. you, you can't forget someone who has stolen so much from you. But I think she thought that he needed to hear that. Absolutely, absolutely. Brandon, I really appreciate you being here. And I know that these things are not easy to, to go back over years later. So thank you for doing that. I really appreciate well, the time. It was a pleasure, sir. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. All right. And thank you for joining us for this episode of The Evidence Room. We're going to be back next week streaming 6.30 p.m. on the KPRC2 Plus app. Next Wednesday's case involves one of the most prolific serial killers in U.S. history, Dean Coral, and his henchmen.